thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Thank you to our distinguished panelists who've come all the way from across Canada to be here. Um, tonight, we are addressing the issue of political correctness in Canada. As Canadians, we pride ourselves in being polite to a fault. The question is though, you know, when courtesy that is freely exchanged be into between individuals, when that becomes compulsory, when, when, peop, um, when mutual, uh, when, when dialogue which is shaped by mutual respect for one another is no longer shaped by respect for dissenting opinions, and when issues which are deemed to be inconvenient or impolite are silenced or ignored, has this gone too far? As we've seen in Canada in the past couple of years when a mild-mannered psychology professor says no to using mandated pronouns, when a TA shows a video of, of that professor discussing his opinions, when we've seen leaders of all varieties be kicked out, silenced for not being part of the status quo, we can see that, have, that political correctness, be, we can see that being politically incorrect can have dire co consequences. Tonight, we are joined by four panelists who all can speak to an aspect of that. Start with Maxime Bernier, leader of the People's Party of Canada. <laughs> Bruce, Bart Bruce Party, a uh, outspoken free speech ad advocate and lawyer and professor at Queen's University. And Jared Brown, a uh, civil litigation attorney and recently elected to the bench of the Ontario Law Society of Ontario. <laughs> and we have Laura Chen, a outspoken social media personality, host of the Pseudo Intellectual on Blaze TV. We will be addressing this question in three parts. Firstly, what is happening? What are our experiences? What have we seen out there? The second question we will be addressing is why this is happening? And then finally, what can we do about it? So to open things up, uh, first question, what is going on out there? And if, Max, would you like to start? Yeah, maybe. Uh I'll be uh, expressing my point of view as a so I'll express my point of view as a politician. So <laughs> I always start when I, and I'll be very quick about it, uh, when I left and decided to um, left the Conservative Party of Canada in August of last year. That was also because political correctness. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, but I did uh, si six tweets on uh, the extreme multiculturalism in Canada. That was not polit political, that was not politically correct. And uh, I received a call from my political uh, correctness leader, Andrew Shear at that time. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me, Maxine, you cannot speak about diversity and against multiculturalism in Canada. I don't know what you're doing, but you know we won't be able to win an election if you are speaking about that. So tomorrow morning I will issue a press release and I'll say that Maxim is not speaking for the Conservative Party of Canada anymore. He's speaking for himself. And, um, and he did it. And so I tried for a year after the leadership to convince the establishment of the Conservative Party of Canada 
to use some of our ideas that we put forward during the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada. At that time, 49% of the membership, they like what I was saying, but uh, after a year, the, uh, a year, the leadership and the establishment of the party decided that it was too bold and uh, they didn't want to take any of uh, the freedom ideas that I put forward. So after when uh, Andrew Scheer said publicly that I don't represent the party anymore, I tweeted, and that was the most uh, popular tweet at that time. And I think I have the tweet here, just one. I said, hereby officially declare the death of political correctness in Canada. That was very popular. And, uh, <laughs> and after that, that's history, we decided to create the People's Party of Canada. But it's too bad that, it's, that in Canada, some politician and the majority of politicians, they don't want to tackle uh, debates about immigration. They don't want to have debates about the equalization formula. They don't want to have debates about uh, other subjects that are controversial. So being a politician, usually you want to have the support of a lot of people. And to do that, you have, in brackets, to be politically correct. And usually a politician will speak about something when they have maybe 45% of support on one idea. If they don't have that support, they won't be out there and speak about the, 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 the reform that we must do in our country. So for me, I'm the opposite. Uh, I like to be... Uh, Political, politically incorrect, mm -hmm. and I think it's going well. <laughs> <laughs> so you must tackle these issues and you must speak about it. You must not be afraid to speak about what you believe. And also, for me, if only 10% of the population agree with one of our ideas, it's a challenge for me. Uh, it's a nice challenge, and my goal is to have more support. And the way to have more support is to, pe to speak more about it. And so that's my way of doing politics. And that's why we said we will have a platform that will be in line with some principle, and we're doing politics differently because all our policies are based on four principles, as you know, individual freedom, personal responsibility, respect, and fairness. And I don't have any other politician that have the courage to do politics like that. It's a little bit new in this country. Uh, Sometimes, you know, it's tough for a politician. You want to be loved by everybody. But, you know, when um, I'm with a person in my own writing that is for the cartel in dairy, poultry, and eggs, I will lose maybe 5,000 votes in my writing because of that position on the cartel of supply management. But I believe that people will support me because I don't want to work for special interest group. I want to work for ordinary Canadians. And maybe there's a cost for that. But, you know, if I'm not elected, I'll be back. I'll go back in the private sector. But I will be able to say to myself, I did what I wanted to do in politics and to push the freedom ideas. But I just want to let you know it's going very well in my writing. It's going very well. We are building this party. And I'm pleased to be here to have the discussion with our friends. And um, I just want to let you know that I don't want to go back when I was a minister under uh, Stephen Harper. And we had talking points. And we were in the position to speak about only on the talking points. So for me, there's no talking points. And that would be the same thing for our candidates for the next general election. The only thing they will have to do is to share our freedom ideas and the basic of our policies, and, uh, and they, they have the right to their own opinion. So let's start the debate, and I'm pleased to. Yeah, I actually think it's the, the idea of political correctness is a little more dangerous. I'm a, I'm a litigation lawyer. I'm a commercial litigator. I advise companies on risk-related issues. I get into the employment world, starting to do a, a, a lot of uh, human rights uh, defense work. And uh, where I see the problem with political correctness and why it actually is a little bit more dangerous than simply in the political realm is that um, when you shut off certain um, 
ideas, notions um, to, to discussion in the legal world, you create orthodoxy, and orthodoxy tends to be implemented into law. And so I'm beginning to see political correctness uh, around issues such as fundamental rights and freedoms, uh, human rights laws, um, speech laws uh, uh, being changed, adapted to enforce political correct ideas or political correct ways of being um, and enforce orthodoxy. And it's actually quite dangerous. And, and uh, an example of that is, for instance, uh, some of you may know uh, the psychologist you mentioned, uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson. Um, Jordan Peterson in 2016 spoke out against uh, a law called, a federal law called Bill C-16. And it, it was implementing uh, an ideology around gender into law. And he began to say, this is what the law says. And he's just a layman and he's just reading what it says on the, on the uh, Human Rights Commission websites and what the law it itself says. Well, um, he began to be mobbed and attacked by people within the legal world. People in my industry started saying, um, you can't talk about that, you can't say that. Now, once again, he's simply reading what the law says and this, this uh, um, orthodox opinion, began, a legal opinion, began to descend around him. And it was actually scary to watch because that, that orthodox opinion was wrong. Jordan was right. The, the law professors, the, the uh, academics were, were actually wrong. And had he not continued forward, um, had people like myself not stepped forward, uh, uh, Professor Party stepped forward and said, no, he's actually right on the law. What he's saying, the effect of the law is completely accurate. We would have been stuck with that orthodoxy. That second opinion, that what I call the true opinion or the accurate opinion, never would have gotten out there. Now, obviously the law was passed, but it, the discussion around it broke through this bubble um, that, that this one way of looking at this issue, this Bill C-16, was the only way. And if you were to challenge it, or basically just tell the world what it says, that you should be you know, cast off into the universe. I mean, typically what you see when someone enunciates a politically incorrect legal opinion, or sorry, when you, typically when you see uh, uh, an idea come out, you'll see uh, uh, law professors begin to assemble and write letters. So for instance, uh, our, our local premier uh, threatened to invoke the notwithstanding clause. Immediately, the academics and professors of the legal world wrote letters, joint letters. Well, you didn't see that with Jordan. Even though he was saying an accurate uh, restatement of the law, they were nowhere to be found. And the reason is, he was on the politically incorrect side of the issue. So it's actually quite dangerous that this, this orthodoxy, this enforcement of political correctness eventually finds its way into the legal space and then I'm having to fight against it. Yeah, and so the, the let's just say this, the, uh, the idea at the bottom of both the legal version of this and the version that you will encounter having dinner with your friends is that there is only one version that is legitimate. You've got to, you have to believe and say a certain thing or the other things that you would otherwise believe and say are actually not worthy and, and should not be spoken. That's what we're talking about, right? We're talking about the, the, the narrowing of acceptable speech, but also the narrowing of acceptable belief, because your speech reflects what you believe, right? So you have this, 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 this thing happening in the law, the idea being, well, you know, the law should require what the prevailing view is. And we should make people use pronouns or say this or check the box for summer, you know, job grant programs. This is a very dangerous thing. It used to be that our central idea was individual freedom. You know, you say what you want. And we have drifted. You're responsible of what you're saying. Absolutely. But we have drifted away from that idea in so many respects in the professions, at universities, and you know, having dinner with your friends at the kitchen table. There are just some things you can't say. And whenever that happens, you know you're into that realm of political correctness. Now, I'm not a historian, but I understand that some people say that the, that the concept of political correctness came from the Soviet Union in the early days of the Soviet Union. And you know, that makes sense, right? That's the whole idea. You have to be correct in order to be legitimate. And that idea is, is becoming to be accepted in this society, and that's the problem because that's as far away from the organizing principle that we're supposed to be arranged around 
that uh, you know we're in we're in a bad way. Well, I think the scary thing about political correctness is. As scary as it is right now, and it's this big behemoth, it's actually not very popular among your average Canadian. It's not, or your average American. Most people support free speech in general, and they accept that if you don't believe that there are 47 pronouns, you shouldn't have to use it. The problem is that the people who advocate for political correctness, they may not be very numerous, but they are very smart. They're very organized. So what they've done is they've managed to insert themselves into positions of power in pretty much every industry and every walk of life. They're in politics. They're in the law. You can bet your bottom dollar they're in the school systems, they're in the media, and they're also on social media. So it, it's a huge problem because what we have is this very small group of people that, in my opinion, has very radical ideas that do not represent the majority of people, but they're exercising their power to shape our culture so that one day they may be the majority. And it's it's a scary thing. And if we don't start talking about it now, we may be in a position in the not too distant future when we don't we don't even have the power to speak up about it, where we don't have any platforms, where we don't have any any politicians who are willing to speak up about it, or even everyday citizens, because right now what they're doing is they're they're really they're stamping out anything that might challenge uh, the status quo. They're they're showing people um, like what they try to do to Jordan Peterson that there is a price for speaking your mind and coming out against what they believe. And I I feel very badly, but I understand the Canadians who, despite disagreeing with this political correctness craziness, are just too afraid to speak out because they don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to alienate themselves from their friends or their families. A student who doesn't want to risk getting a bad grade because they've disagreed with the professor. And it's a huge problem. Yes, I agree with you. And if you look just only the debate on climate change, if you question the consensus that they're saying there's a scientific consensus on climate change. And if you're saying, I don't think so, there's other uh, scientists who think other, have another point of view on climate change. Oh my God, you're not on the right side of the debate. And so that's, uh, that's happening at the political level. You know, they, there's some subject that you cannot question. There's no debate, there's a consensus. Don't question that. And that's a way for them to impose their point of view. We need to be out there to challenge that. That's our job. And, and taking that example, you're, you're seeing the movement from that idea, you know, any different idea or perception on the issue of climate change, you're now seeing that manifest, or, or their, their efforts to, to stamp that out, you're now seeing it move into not only the policy, but the legal realm. There, there is discussion that you will see about the idea of somehow punishing those who don't toe the party line or the, the politically correct line on that issue. And that terrifies me. It terrifies me as a lawyer. It terrifies me as a citizen that, that uh, you know, the government is going to create uh, um, legislated orthodoxy. And, and this is the mechanism by which the minority, as Lauren was describing, is, is able to assert control over dialogue. Yes. And let's just note the ironies here. Two of the values that are promoted um, by virtue of political correctness are tolerance and diversity. You must be tolerant and you must be in favor of diversity. And in order to make sure that you are in favor of tolerance and diversity, we will be intolerant about what you say and we'll make sure that you conform with your ideas, right? You're right. right? So, I mean, it. The whole thing makes no sense, but it does run on the fear of being outed. It's a little bit like a, a, a society-wide witch hunt, right? You don't want to be the one who's pointed at and said, you know, that, that person is no good. But it is the minority that you're talking about who is willing to point those fingers. And because nobody wants to be the one who's, who's, who's getting pointed at, everybody is inclined to want to conform. But that, that's the moment of danger. Now, the um, people who are, who are pushing this political agenda, they say that it's about politeness, respect for others, and that, uh, you know, in, in the issue of the environment, that, you know, the science is settled. Well, what, what are your thoughts on that and, and that? Well, I find it very interesting how these people like to pick and choose when they want to side with science, right? When it, we're talking yeah. about environmentalism, we can't question science. No, it's we have to listen to what they say. When it comes to gender... It's not that it's not that simple. Uh, you know, it's it's a question of validating someone's humanity. 
I, I, I like science. I like the environment. But the thing is, these people are ideologues. So anything they they talk about, they're coming at it from an agenda of trying to enforce more big government. And, and we can see that um, w with issues like, for example, speech laws. Like if, if this is all about promoting science, then shouldn't we be encouraging more funding into things like, for example, gender dysphoria? I would love to see more science about that. I mean, if, if we're really so concerned about climate change, then why, why aren't we looking into I don't know, diff different types of alternatives, things that don't just equal more taxes uh, on carbon, because the only, I guess, surefire thing that I can see is that that ends up taking more money from Canadians. So, I mean, th these people, they want to paint themselves as pro-science and pro-tolerance, pro-understanding, but it's, it's only all of those things if you fit a very specific definition that they want you to conform to. Yes, and let me take you back to a moment. Uh, Jared, I was talking about the uh, Senate hearings into C-16. Um, there was a moment during those hearings where one of the senators basically said, well, but you know, using a, a, a non-gendered pronoun for a person who doesn't want to have a gender is, is a reasonable thing to do. So what's so wrong with the law requiring reasonable speech? And if you don't notice what the problem is, then we're really down a rabbit hole, right? Because the problem is this. It doesn't matter what's reasonable or not reasonable. Reasonable or not reasonable is for the individual to decide, right? So my response to that question at the Senate was, well, just imagine this. Imagine that we had a statute in front of us that said everybody is required to say hello and please and thank you. Now, hello and please and thank you are reasonable things to say, are they not? Sure. But is it reasonable for the government to require you to say hello and please and thank you? Absolutely not, because now you've got the state controlling the content of private conversations. And so it's got nothing to do with whether or not somebody thinks that the content of the speech is reasonable or not. It's nothing to do with it. What it has to do with is, are you allowed to say what you think, regardless of what that is? And the, the way the, the law is going, as Jared describes, is, uh-uh. The law has to reflect what, 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 the, what, the, what the minority thinks is reasonable, and you will be required to follow that. that, that that's a bad thing. There's an example of, of what you just uh, discussed. Um, some people may not know, but we have a, the legal regulator in Ontario. It's called the Law Society of Ontario. And a few years ago, the board of directors of that body, called the Convocation, uh, passed a series of measures that they indicated were to improve uh, diversity, uh, inclusivity and equity in the profession and one of those measures was that all lawyers were going to be uh, required to uh, prepare a statement of principles whereby they affirm their duty to promote diversity inclusivity and equity not only in their professional life but also in their personal life and what you see there I mean it, it, it's ob it, it's clearly what we call compelled speech the Supreme Court of Canada has said that that's totalitarian they did not mince words uh, however, our legal regulator uh, passed this because they thought, well, what, what could you have against diversity or inclusivity? And therefore, because those are nice ideas and nice thoughts, we are going to use the authoritarian impulse of compelled speech to make you say the words, to make you believe what we believe. And uh, I mean, I'm happy to say we, we successfully so far have pushed back against it. Well, just so you know, that just yesterday, Jared was elected as a bencher of convocation on a platform to reverse this very uh, policy. So there is there is hope. And, and this goes to Lauren's uh, uh, comment. It was a, a strong vocal minority that was pushing this stuff. When, when we actually put the issue of this compelled speech measure to the lawyers of Ontario who, who voted in the election, um, not only myself, but a, a slate of candidates who ran on that one issue won in a landslide. And that tells me that there is sanity in our profession and that there are reasonable people and that common sense will prevail. Freedom reigns. I mean, basically what happens is if you've got authoritarians on one side and you've got those who champion individual rights and freedoms on the other, individual rights and freedoms will win. And this is worth pointing out. So it is exactly the way Jared described, that in this election where there was a choice and that choice could be taken privately, then people chose to resist this policy. However, the year before, when lawyers were actually required to do this, nearly everybody went along. 
because it's difficult to stand up and say no, because now you're the bad guy. And that's the dynamic that this political correctness thing runs on. Yeah. <laughs> And I just want to say when people are given the very clear option of, you know, on the one side you have authoritarianism, political correctness, craziness, but on the other side you have general general respect and responsibility and freedom, people will, I think, generally go, go to freedom. But the problem with these people is that that's not how they're going to frame this discussion. And that's a huge problem because they're going to paint the people who are adv advocating for things like personal responsibility and just equality for all Canadians, regardless of skin color, they're going to paint them as racist, as xenophobic, as Islamophobic. And so that, I think, is a huge issue that people who are speaking against political correctness right now have to try to combat because you can be against political correctness all you want, but if people still believe that you're doing it because you're racist or because you just hate immigrants, they're not going to support you. I encourage everyone to Which get in. Which is not the case, by the way. <laughs> I encourage everyone to, to not only look at Max's uh, Twitter mentions after he tweeted the tweet that he discussed at the outset, but come look at mine. Um, we were not opposing diversity, inclusivity, or equity in what we were doing in this particular election, but racist, bigot, every ad hominem, every epithet you can imagine for challenging this one tactic that they were using to try and implement that agenda. So um, it comes at you loud, it comes at you noisy, but it's coming from a very small group of people and frankly, uh, uh, more uh, reasonable people see through it. And I agree that we can win the battle because you're right, when people are faced with the choice between more freedom or more government and less freedom, and you explain that to people, you will win. And that's, that's, my, that's why I'm optimistic about it. Uh, that's only a, a minority that is very uh, visible and out, out loud out there, but we just have to explain that. And that's why when I'm doing politics, I try to appeal to the intelligence of people and not to their emotion. And sometimes it is a challenge but at the end, you know, the best ideas will win and we have the best ideas. What is better than more freedom and personal responsibility? But we need to do what need to be done. We need to be out there and to challenge them. And you're doing that pretty well. And, you know, I'm very pleased today to be with you. It's, uh, it's an honor. You, you are defending free speech. What is, it's, it's the best uh, battle that we can have and we're gonna win that battle. So social media has played a, um, a big part of the battles over uh, free, free speech and political correctness. Is, is, it, is this a byproduct? Like is, is, free, is social media causing more political correctness or is it just the nature of, of the discussion? And Laura, would you... Well, I, th I think what we have going on on social media is something called echo chambers, which is that people tend to congregate and follow and subscribe to people who enforce the same worldview that they have. Because everyone likes to be told how right they are all the time. I like it. I mean, I actually am, so that's different for other people. But um, And so we see that really going on on social media. And the, the problem with echo chambers, aside from the fact that it can make you ignorant in a lot of ways, is that it can also easily radicalize people, right? Because if you're constantly being told how right and justified you are, and not only that, but how wrong and evil and malicious the other side is, it can very easily radicalize people. And the issue with social media is that not only are echo chambers being fostered, but we actually have large organizations like Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube with, with millions and millions of users, um, they're enforcing in their own way the same political correctness ideology. We talk about social media censorship a lot on our show. And it's not just because, you know, our livelihood depends on, on social media and I don't want to get booted off, but it's because in, unless you have a platform for yourself to discuss these ideas, then you've already lost the battle. Um, there are two candidates who are running for, uh, I guess, European Parliament in the UK, um, who because Twitter doesn't like them, their political campaign accounts have been banned. Could you imagine if his political campaign account was banned from Twitter because he had the wrong opinions? That essentially ends an entire movement. And when we are operating in a democracy, I don't think I need to tell you all how important it is to have those platforms for everybody, especially when you have a media that's committed to enforcing the status quo and backing up the establishment and that they're not gonna give any time to us. So being able to create our own audience, 
and our own platform that's so important without social media, we can't do that. And they are actively trying to stop us from doing that. Um, I think the other issue is that social media amplifies that minority of voices that like people to toe the party line. The politically correct crowd appear to be louder. It has given them a platform to be able to uh, appear to have expanded their influence, their reach, and their numbers. And unfortunately, from what I can tell, is the social media entities are actually listening, listening to that loud minority uh, it, because they think that that is, in fact, what the greater community wants. I think uh, just like uh, in, in all the issues we've been talking about, if normal, reasonable, sane people begin to push back and show that the numbers are not on the side of those who enforce the Overton window in the orthodoxy, but are actually, in fact, in the wider public sphere, I think you, you can change that. But I think that's what's happening on social media is, is that that loud, vocal, well-organized minority um, are, are using that platform like a megaphone, and it's yeah, working. Yes, yeah, and it makes the dynamic more acute, right? So because, you know, we are, we are evolutionarily... Um, inclined to be part of part of a group right because it in, increases your chance of survival in the wild I bet that that's what they say I'm not an evolutionary biolog biologist but but we we have a natural instinct to want to belong and th those conversations that happen in social media it's much easier to call somebody out as not adhering to the line of the group than it would be without it because who knows? I mean, you're just talking to all kinds of people every day in all different kinds of places. But online, it's all visible to everybody. So if you step out of line, you're out. And the responses that you will get sometimes that are extreme, I know that I've chatted with people on Twitter. Well, chatted is not the word to use. Um, but, but the extreme views you get, uh, you know, are not really intended for me. They're, they're showing their group that they're on side that they're holding up the team. And so you they're get They're virtue signaling. They're virtue signaling, no question. And, and, there's, and there's, it's a polarization. There's, they're, they're a member of a team, and they want to show that their team is better than the team that they think that I'm on. So all the dynamics that would exist ordinarily are made, are amplified and made much worse by social media. Yeah, speaking on social media, I think for me, it is, as a politician, it is very important, you know, we are able and we were able to build this party with 40,000 members after five months because of our ideas, but also because of the social media. The Reform Party 15 years ago, they tried to create and they created a party, but they, they didn't have the membership after five months. It took them six years to be able to be a strong party. And at the end, they were only a Western party. So because of the social media and we are using it, and yes, sometimes I'm afraid that what can happen to us, uh, Facebook, maybe they can look at my Facebook or Twitter. Uh, so it's, it's a challenge, but we need social media and we need people like you to be out there. Because of social media, you are here today and people understand our message, so that's great. But sometimes I'm looking at it and see the more popular it would be, the more successful I would be. Maybe the bad side would be uh, Twitter and Facebook will look at me and they can ban me or do something that you just said with the politician in Europe. So you don't want that, but you know, I will be myself on social media and we'll see what will happen. Uh, but there's a little risk over there and uh, I cannot control that risk to be banned and things like that. And, and I think another way that social media actually is currently affecting our political process is um, the, the people who are most active on social media tend to be the most extreme, the most vocal, the really committed um, activists. The problem with that is that a lot of politicians now, they kind of judge the popularity of their ideas based on the feedback they're getting from social media. Um, this is a problem because I think for a lot of political parties, uh, the Liberals absolutely in, in, in Canada, as well as the Democrats in the United States, they're going further and further left with their issues because they're basing what their, um, you know, th their party members want on what they're seeing on social media. But these social media activists are not representative of the of their average base. And I think they're they're really starting to alienate a lot of people in that way, which depending on how you look at it, could actually be a good thing for people who are presenting sane policies and saying, well, let's let's take a step back here. There's a reason that certain electoral results are coming as a surprise to those who might be on the left of the political spectrum right now. You think of uh, you think of Mr. Ford locally, you think of Mr. Trump down south. 
um, even our little venture election, the other side was trauma traumatically surprised by the outcome of the election. And it's because that loud minority on social media living in that bubble think that they've actually got the movement behind them. They've got the numbers behind them. And when people go into the darkness of the polling booth and can speak their own minds and think their own thoughts, this loud vocal minority is is always shocked and surprised. And so the resistance is rising up at the Law Society as we speak, just like the resistance in, in the south of the border. Uh, they, they are so, uh, it takes them by, so, uh, by surprise in such a significant way that, it, and it's because of they, they nest on social media and they're very loud. And of course that perception is only added to by mainstream media, right? Who would seem to be in the same bubble for some reason. Uh, they, they, they seem to take that message as given, and of course, they're looking for controversy because controversy is good for for uh, for clicks and eyeballs. And the controversy that's that's convenient is often the accusation that somebody is extreme. So they take that accusation and they run with it, and and that's the story, and that's the perception, and that's why the bubble exists. Um, but it only takes one prick, and then it's gone. No, to to the. Um... <clears throat> The antithesis of the, the vocal minority is the silent majority. So why are we, you know, when, when we're seeing these issues come up, why are so many still remaining silent on it? It's the threat. It's, it's They're the not afraid, yeah. It's fear. It's fear. It's fear. Because number one, you don't want to be the one who's accused of being a bad person. And number two... Rational argument doesn't seem to work with those people. And number three, even if it did, you would have to have worked out what the rational argument was, and you shouldn't have to do that. But it's, it's fear. The silent majority gets the courage to do otherwise when they see that other people are doing it too, or in the privacy of the, of the ballot box. And <coughs> politician, you know, if they have a bad day in a social, in, not in social media, in mainstream media, a bad day news, that would be the end of the world. Uh, for me, I think you know, I didn't have only one bad day. I had two months, three months, a bad day uh, ten years ago in the news, and so they're not used to that. They're looking at the news. They're looking at the news. Oh my God! And they will just be silent instead of fighting. Because they're, they're not used to have bad coverage for a day, two days, or, or a week. So for me, if I have a bad coverage, I don't like it. But, you know, it's part of the game. I'll be able to go. I said, you know, I said what I believe, and, you know, that's it. And uh, tomorrow it would be another day. But it is, it is tough. It is tough. And most politicians, like I said, they want to please everybody. And they're afraid of the mainstream media. I'll give you an example. I did an interview a couple of years ago, and I said, we must cut corporate welfare and no more subsidies to businesses. I was at CBC, and the journalist looked at me, and she said, she said, are you serious? And that was a controversy. And she looked at me, oh, my God, you cannot do that. And, she, and when I said, do you know that 65% of the entrepreneurs in this country they don't want subsidies. They just want lower taxes. So I'm not a radical. They don't want subsidies. They don't want to pay for a lobbyist and try to have a subsidies that they know it will be very hard. And if they don't have the right contacts and the right person, they don't know the right person. So business sector, business entrepreneur, they don't, they, they're, they're, they're proud. They don't want to go out there and ask for a subsidies. They want lower taxes. So when I said that argument, she looked at me. Well, where is, you know, look at the survey that they did last month, and that was it. But, you know, in the beginning, the first, oh, you're the first one to say that you want to end corporate welfare, that must be it. And so you're kind of a crazy politician. But. And let's just acknowledge this. Political correctness is an elitist idea, right? Because somebody has to define what the correctness is, yes? And the, and the CBC is part of that elite. Right, so if you're talking in a way that the CBC disapproves of, then you're you're not you're can't you can't be correct. Um, you you got to have authority in order to be able to define that correctness, and it's true that that these ideas are reflected by all different kinds of people, but they get those ideas from somebody who has said, "Here's what to believe," and if you don't believe that, then you're wrong, and so go and say that all those other people are wrong. You know, march or go on Twitter or 
do what you have to do, but you know, you're on our team and go and enforce our idea that we've told you. This happens in the schools, it happens in the universities, it happens in the professions. Witness the shifting narrative around the immigration debate. So uh, uh, people like Max have been saying that uh, we've got to, we can have an intelligent conversation about immigration in this country and we can do it like adults. Um, and of course, uh, uh, the, the Liberal Party said no, racist, bigot, you name it, don't even go there, can't talk about it, can't talk about how it works. However, suddenly the ice is breaking. The liberals are beginning to acknowledge that there might be an issue with, with um, illegal immigration into our country. Well, that was a forbidden topic, what, six months ago? But when you, when you break that, that, that log jam, when you begin to trigger that cognitive dissonance with facts, like, like you did at the CBC, um, it, it begins to open up the space to have an intelligent conversation. So it's actually interesting to see enforced orthodoxy, political correctness on the immigration issue, and all of a sudden the log jam breaking a little bit as of late. So this idea of you know, the, the enforced political orthodoxy you know, is this is this like intentionally being created, or is this just again a byproduct of everyone's acquiescence to the status quo? I think it's the authoritarian uh, instinct on the part of some people in society to enforce their way of thinking. It's their way or the highway, and that's where it comes from. You, you've got to think like like I think. You've got to you've got to act like I act, and I think it comes from that. And then and like I said, there's a loud vocal min minority that that support that idea, um, but then there's a, a majority out there who just want to get up and go to work and do their thing and enjoy their their rights and freedoms, and, and frankly, they don't have time for what is a, an elitist exercise. And it's a reflection of that tension between the competing ideas of individual and group, right? If, if, you, if you think that the group is the important thing, then that group has to have cohesion. And the thing that makes them cohesive is ideas and speech. So political correctness comes from the idea that the group is the important thing. If you think that the individual is the important thing, then political correctness makes no sense at all. It just makes no sense. How, how could you conceive of such a thing? Because everybody's thoughts are their own, everybody's speech is their own, and they should be different. That's the whole point. People's ideas and speech should be different. That's how we get along. But if you believe in the group, if you believe that cohesion is the most important thing, if you believe in obedience to a set of ideas, that's where the notion of correctness comes from. And for me as a politician, you know that uh, you want our candidates to share your point of view, to have the party line, but at the same time, you want them to express their point of view. So I'll give you an example of what I did during the last um, by-election. Uh, I had a great candidate, Laura Lynn Thompson in Burnaby South. And she did fight at the provincial level all that theory of gender fluidity. So I was at the CBC and I was very uh, presenting my candidate. And so the journalist asked, you have that lady in Burnaby South that she's against gender fluidity and how come she's running with you, blah, 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 blah. And I said, she has the right to their, her own ideas and you know, I, I'm perfectly okay with that. She can speak about it, but you know we're doing politics at the federal level. She won't be able to influence that. It's mostly at the provincial level in the education, education system. But that's her own point of view, and I'm okay with it. But she tried to tell me that you must not have a person like that on your team because maybe you don't share that, and if you don't share it, she cannot be on your team. And at, at the end, she asked me the question, do you share our point of view or not about gender fluidity as the leader? I said, it's not important. It's, that's our point of view. It's not a policy at the federal level. It's like abortion. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it's for me, my candidate can have position, different position on abortion, and they will have the right to table a bill on that because it's a right to a member of a right, a member of parliament has the right to table a bill on any subject, a private member bill. And if it is not part of our platform. Maybe a candidate from the member of parliament from the People's Party will table a bill on different subject and will have a debate, and that would be a free vote. But in politics, usually, it's the party line that is important. And if you don't follow the party line, you'll have a call from the whip, 
And you know, you won't have all the privilege that you can have as an MP. You won't be able to sit on the committee that you want to sit, that you like. So all that we need to give to, give to the members of parliament more freedom. The most important for us, the people who are coming with us must share our principle. And if they share our principles and, and the platform, that's perfect, but they can have other point of views and that's okay. But you know, it's not, you, usually you don't do politics like that. You try to control the message, you try to control uh, the, con the candidates and you know, we won't do that. We won't control 338 candidates. And yes, we'll have somebody that will say something different and, and or somebody that will make a mistake but that's part of life and that person will be uh, will stay part of our team you know as, as Canadians we have certain characteristics some would say and some of those characteristics work against us and one of those characteristics is that we're conflict averse. We don't like conflict. If people have different ideas and say different things, you're going to have conflict. You should have conflict. Conflict's not a bad thing. You're going to have clashes, disagreements, debates, like f fiery debates. That's okay. But, but this aversion to conflict, I think, leads to a lot of this idea that, oh, well, you, you really shouldn't say that. It, it, it'll, it'll cause a problem, whatever the context is, whether it's small and private or big and public, whether it's a political party or, or, or otherwise. If there are things you shouldn't say, then you got a problem. You should say them. You should have conflict. It is our inclination to think that the purpose of civil society is to avoid conflict. That's not true at all. Civil society is supposed to be there to, be, to, to enable us to have conflict without violence. And that's a huge difference. I think that's absolutely right. And the thing is, as proud as I am to be a Canadian, I have to say, I think the reason why our country is in such a precarious position right now concerning political correctness is because for too long we refused to have that debate of, of conflict. Uh, going back to the, the issue of gender pronouns, for instance, we are now having a discussion about whether it should be legal to disrespect someone by by using not their preferred pronoun um, was I did I just miss the entire debate we supposedly had about whether that was even respectful in the first place to deny reality in some cases I mean it's like we've missed an entire part of the conversation it's just now all of a sudden we're supposed to accept the idea that yes this is what is respectable and accurate and now we all have to like no let's go back a little bit because we've missed some really big parts of the conversation here and it's the same thing with immigration we're now having the debate of whether it should be okay to say hey maybe we go back to a merit-based system i mean i've been called a white supremacist for that are you saying that non-white people don't have merit i mean i, I don't get it we, we we need to like slow down and go back to conversations we should have had about 10 years ago that was a way to silence you saying oh you're a white supremacist because you're saying that so that's that's their game. They, they just want to t put some etiquettes on us, and uh, but that's not working. And if you don't think that you've been sort of affected or cowed by political correctness, um, you just simply have to look around and see what happens when somebody is perceived to be politically incorrect. We've talked about the Jordan Peterson phenomenon. If you go online and, and look at the YouTube community, such as uh, 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 Lauren's channel, who are discussing uh, big ideas in important ways, the popularity of these things shows that, that people aren't used to uh, getting outside that politically correct bubble and hearing people talk freely and uh, about important subjects in an intelligent way. And so uh, uh, Mark Stein uh, said something uh, at a speech I was at uh, that I thought was pretty interesting. If you don't think you're living in a polit politically correct world, think to yourself, when was the last time somebody said you're entitled to your opinion? It doesn't happen anymore. The other one is, when is the last time you heard, well, we live in a free country? You don't hear that anymore, and there's a reason. We're living in a different world right now, and we need to break through that bubble. Just to, so why is it that it's only certain subjects that seem to bring up political correctness into the debate? Like, we don't hear about, um, you know, politically incorrect supply management or, or such. 
why is it only subjects of immigration and 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 these things that bring bring this into the conversation well i i would kind of disagree that only certain subjects have the politically correct uh, approach to them. I think political correctness, unfortunately, is an ideology that can be applied to pretty much anything. Um, for example, you mentioned supply and demand. It could, I fully believe that somewhere out there, there is a social justice advocate who believes that by being against supply and demand, you are uh, somehow being sexist or patriarchal against, I don't know, uh, small female farmers in Manitoba. I could believe it. There's, there's, there's probably a person out there, but I think we just don't talk about those issues as much maybe, so they don't get um, mentioned. And I think when it comes to things like immigration or gender issues, I, I think a lot of this happens like what we saw with Jordan Peterson. These conversations are kind of sparked um, in places like universities. So the, when it comes to things like gender studies departments, et cetera, et cetera, they're not as interested currently in things like economics as they are social issues. Now, with with our universities too, and and let's go into a bit about like what's going on in in universities. <laughs> God only knows. <laughs> what is going on at universities? Um, where to start with that? Uh, the, the university is a particular kind of culture, yes? And of course, they're all a little different, but they're mostly the same. And they're occupied, again, not to a person. There are pockets of exceptions and people who are exceptions, no doubt about it. But as an institution, they have become... Um, dominated by a certain set of ideas. You know, social justice ideology is the, is the fuel that universities now run on. And uh, it's reflected in their administrative policies, in their student policies, in the curriculum, in the programs that they run. And it is not the case, I'm not saying that there are no individual academics who are not allowed to, to vary from that line. That's not true, I do it myself, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, I haven't been told I'm not allowed to do that. Great. Uh, but a, a, as, as a group, that's what they're into. And they are training people to think in that way. The idea that students go to university to learn critical thinking is, from what I can see, largely not true. Um, they are there to learn a certain way of thinking, and they take that way of thinking into the larger world. And it used to be, I think, that that, that people used to say, oh, well, you know, the universities, they're dominated by crazy lefty people, and, but don't worry about it. They're all in their ivory tower. and Just leave them alone. They're, they're harmless. Not anymore, because the people who have been at university are now no longer at university. They're in your corporations, and they're in your HR departments. They're lawyers. They're, 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 in your, <laughs> they're, they're lawyers. They're, they're running your governments. And so those lessons have been taken, and they're now being applied. And it's one reason why it's so hard to push back, because they think they're doing the right thing. They're doing what they were taught. And so it's a very hard mountain to climb to, to back them all the way up and say, no, 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 the, 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 the pillars upon which your way of, of, of thinking is based are not are not correct. That's a lot of remediation to do, and it's it's very difficult to get somebody to that place. And it's a reality when you have a legislation that is saying if you want to build a pipeline, you must do before a gender analysis. So, and it's a reality. It's in the law. Can you believe that in 2019 having something like that? It's so. Yes, the prime minister went to a school like that for sure. Well, and not only that. <laughs> But those who sit on the bench, the judges who are interpreting that very law, went to these same schools. And we're now seeing it uh, within the judicial ranks. And, and they're fundamentally, uh, well, I'm not going to say, yeah, they're fundamentally changing our society and implementing an ideology that not everyone may agree with. And so you have, you have to be aware that these ideas that Bruce is talking about, they graduate. They get jobs. Um, yeah, I was in university not that long ago. I graduated going on five years now. No one do any math with that information. Just leave it. Ah. Um, so th what I've noticed is I still go back to universities for things like speeches. And I've noticed that since I've been gone, things have just regressed so, so quickly. And the the amount of professors that like proclaim to be self-avowed Marxists, that's not me trying to be hyperbolic. That's actually what they call themselves. It would shock you. And it's, it's really scary because essentially 
these universities have become mini indoctrination camps. And I, I very firmly believe that people should go to universities to not only like learn uh, information, uh, science, math, whatever their subject may be, but also to learn to think critically, which is just not happening anymore. Essentially, there are a lot of professors who unfortunately aren't as open-minded uh, as people like you or, or Dr. Peterson. There are p professors out there where if they see a student who doesn't toe the line for political correctness or whatever, they will penalize them. So, you know, not only in universities are students being taught that, oh, apparently this is the way that the world just is, because they're not getting a, another another opinion or a diverse view, but they're also being taught that if I say otherwise, I will be punished. And that's such a, it's such a sad state of mind to have in somewhere like academia that's supposed to be about free thought, free experience expression as well. So should I perhaps give you just my own experience with this? In the past year, 18 months, um, I have invited to Queens to give talks uh, Jordan Peterson, uh, Conrad Block, uh, Amy Wax, who is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Um, and on each occasion, in different ways, uh, the uh, faculty and or students, or at least a, p a portion of the population, has basically said, you shouldn't be doing this. You can't do this. And, and in one it, in one instance, they appealed to the principal of the university to 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 uh, to at least disapprove of the Jordan Peterson talk. Um, in in one situation, the students you know started to put together a petition, sort of condemning the the, the event. Um, and this is the kind of response that you get, uh, where you we, where your project is simply to get someone into a room to say what they think, and the response is. That, that can't be done. Now, I should point out, to their credit, that the, that the administration at, at Queens, the principal and the, the dean of law on these occasions, said, on the contrary, this is the business that we're in. We will have free speech, and we will have debate, and so the, the events went on as planned, which is great. But uh, it just reflects, I think, the underlying inclinations of many of the people who are there. But that ideology also is at the UN with their agenda 2030. And, you know, you look at them, they want to impose their point of view, their vision of the society. Uh, and so there's less individual freedom. And so that's why, you know, the, the fight that we did against uh, the migration compact, that was important. But that's in that organization, the majority of the people over there, they believe in the strong government that will manage everybody and starting by doing legislation against freedom, freedom of speech and things. And so it's a, it's a fight that we must do. Uh, we must do it here in Canada and we must push for it and we will do it. The, the pushback against you on that issue was interesting because what you were, what you were given was, well, it's not binding on us. And what's funny is if you're actually a thinking person watching that, you why think, sign it? why sign it? It's a statement of intent when you sign it. So while it's not binding, the people who have signed it have said, we're going to do this. We like this idea. And so uh, I found that a, a neat little tr trick to enforce the political, politically the, correct view. It's the same dynamic, yes, with the Paris Climate Change Accord, yeah. right? The, 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 the commitments yeah. that we've made under the Paris Climate Change Accord are not binding either. They're not binding. Yeah. And yet, my God, if you listen to the powers that be, it is essential that we meet those targets because the sky is going to fall if we don't. But why so, sign it? Why, you know, it's, it's not binding, so don't worry about it because that's what you said about the other one. A contract's not right. binding in the legal sense unless somebody dares to try and enforce it or do something about a breach, right? right. So I'd like to uh, open it up to our first uh, audience question session. So we have some uh, volunteers. I'd like to um, get the opinion of the panel as to uh, whether this intolerance we call political correctness is more Mike, dangerous and more. 
Richard Hillier, and I'd, I'd like to um, ask a question of the panel uh, with regard to um, this intolerance we call political correctness. I'd like to know if you think it's more dangerous in certain areas of our society than others. The uh, legal profession uh, comes as an obvious one, but I'd like to hear the panel's opinion. It is everywhere, so that's the, the challenge. It is everywhere. So when you have politicians that are passing legislation, you know, that's the, the top of the iceberg. So when you, you're at that point, uh, it's, it's becoming very dangerous. And so if politicians are doing that, it's because they feel the, the pressure from different interest group to do it. So when it's, it is at that point, it's because for me, it's in every, every industry, I don't know if I'm right, but. Uh, I think academia, I think science, uh, to have a politically correct view on a scientific subject, I think is, is antithesis to what the scientific method is all about. Um, but certainly in the legal world, that's what I deal with every day. I see it all the time. Orthodox opinions coming not only from other lawyers, but from the bench uh, and within the legislation. Yeah, I, I agree. The one that I would add that's acutely problematic is public education. You know, little kids in school because the government controls the curriculum and they will tell you what the kids must be taught and the, the uh, school boards and the teachers unions all have control over that and, you know. Yeah, I would agree that political correctness is most dangerous when it comes to anything to do with children. And I'm going to be specific and say that the gender ideology specifically, because not only are children from the age of five being taught about things like the gender unicorn and that gender is whatever you feel and you can change it willy nilly. Um, th this doesn't just lead to them having questionable opinions. Uh, we, we are also seeing that now the, the political correct thing to do is to advocate for children to be able to take hormone blockers and different hormones as young as seven years old. So th this isn't a question of like, oh, right or wrong opinion, I just want my opinion to be enforced. This is having real life consequences on these children who will now not go on to develop properly. They may actually be sterile for the rest of their lives because of this. And, you know, they may actually end up going through things like surgeries for opinions, feelings they may not have when they're 18, 19, 20 years old. And the thing is, like, these these opinions haven't been long haven't been around long enough where we know what the long-term consequences are. I believe that as adults, you should be able to live however you want and identify however you want, whatever, your, your thing, go for it. But when it comes to kids, we do have a responsibility as adults to have some protections in place. And, and not only that, but uh, we're actually seeing in, I think it's BC recently, a father was, uh, I think, condemned as having committed familial violence or, or something akin to that because he used the wrong pronoun for his young daughter or biological, or whatever you want, no one sue me, but it's, 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 it's worrying. This is affecting children, this is affecting families, and it's, it's gone way too far. Hello, my name is Igor, and uh, one thing that uh, I think uh, Lauren said uh, very well today is that, uh, uh, yes, the politically correct people are a very small minority, but uh, they infiltrate the positions of power and uh, go from there to affect changes in our society that uh, not everyone may agree with. So my question would be, uh, what uh, mechanisms, legislative or otherwise, can we introduce to make sure that the, uh, that the authoritarians that uh, happen to get to, into positions of power uh, don't do any uh, major damage? Uh, so how can we mitigate that? Thank you. Uh, we can do that together. You know, we spoke about the silent majority. So the majority must not be silent. And you'll have an impact on politicians, you'll have an impact. So be with us and do the fight. Yeah, you, get it. you have to do that at, at the political level and the institutional level, but you also have to do it at the personal level. Right now, when you're sitting around the table and you're talking to people who have a different view than you and somebody says something like, oh yeah, well, who could possibly think X? Well, that's your moment. Say, well, actually, I do. And that'll cause a problem, and that's what you're after. You're, you're after standing up and causing problems and having difficult conversations. When you start to erode the power of correctness, then you start getting somewhere. 
And as a father, I'm having some difficult conversation with my daughter. She's 19, uh, 20 years old now, and the other one, 17. And they went to uh, the school and they came back at home. And so we had good discussion. But that's important to have this discussion. And so we must do that personally. And after that, with our friends, with our family, and out there. The more, more vocal will be, the better will be for our society. Well, I mean, in terms of specific policies or things that we can do, I think personally the Canadian government should reaffirm its commitment to free speech, which is on very questionable grounds right now. And also just as consumers, I think when it comes to things like universities or social media, we need to demand more from the people who are running our institutions, right? Because we have power as consumers. We don't need to go on their site. We don't need to send our kids to these universities if, if they're doing something that we don't like. We can kind of influence chains change with our dollars, which I think we absolutely should. And as parents, if your kids are in public schools, I think there's a lot that you can do in making sure or at least monitoring what your kids are being taught. So, so there's one thing we should just watch out for, though, because there's a bit of a contradiction in there, right? To try and use the law to, to protect ourselves against what politicians might do with the law to, to restrain our, our freedoms. And we, we in, in, in Ontario, we, we have a government uh, directive um, that universities have to prepare and submit a policy <coughs> protecting free speech at their campuses, which is a good thing because they weren't doing that. And they were, they were taking uh, steps and, and policies so as to curb free speech and academic freedom on, on, on their campuses. So the idea behind the directive was good. On the other hand, it's another layer of bureaucracy, another step universities have to perform, another policy they have to develop, another set of documents that have to be parsed and interpreted and, and, and bodies that have to apply it. And it's a whole big additional mess, right? So yes, to use the law to protect yourself against the law, but it would be better if we just got rid of a whole lot of law and uh, just opened the whole thing up to more freedom in general. Hello, uh, my name is Rafik Zemakol. I, uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very thankful for all of you here, all of your work. I've been watching it for quite some time and uh, admire it very much. Uh, my question is a good follow to the last question because uh, uh, my concern is that the ideas of this uh, social justice warrior mob is a intellectual fraud. In an actual legitimate discussion, it's very easy to defeat anyone who holds these opponents. They are a joke. But that means that every time we do that, we are reactive and not proactive to the source of this ideal ideology or ideologue. My concern is that this ideology is funded by some sort of foreign entities, foreign purveyors who are purposely attacking our institutions, infrastructure in our society. Right? My concern is that as long as we continue to be reactive, we will never defeat it because it is coming with a, an infinite amount of financial resources. So we, I believe then there must be a course of action to deal with these root causes of why these ideolo uh, ideologies grow, persist, because they did not come organically, because these are flawed ideologies, inherit, anyone can see that. So my concern is that that means someone is pushing it and we need to be concerned for our national security that we're allowing, for example, the Confucius Institute from China, which is everyone knows, everybody understands, is an arm of this government. What's the question? How do we deal with, with this? Because, you know. Well, I, I look at what you just talked about in the, the funding issue as a form of speech. And if you're going to restrict funding, you are essentially restricting a speech act or, or an expression. And so I would say that you meet speech with more speech. Free speech is available to everyone. Everyone can fund the ideas they want to fund. Everyone can push them. And so I'm actually of the opinion that rather than try and control someone else's speech, you actually simply push forward the speech that you want that opens that Overton window and, and speak up. Um, you know, marshal your financial resources towards those people that will speak for you. Meet that challenge on the battlefield of ideas.
this is still reactive because we will continue to be flooded by by money from groups and people who don't who are going to go against this. We can keep being reactive, and I'm not saying control speech at all. Zero control speech or control money. Zero. I want more independence, more freedom. But we are kidding ourselves if we think that there are not these active institutions working against us. And as long as we well, what are we doing today? We are reacting today. You know, so that's important. Yes, we are reacting because that ideology is there and it's dominant in every a lot of circles. So we have to be 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 here and speak about it. That's why we are here. We are reacting, and that's good. Everybody must react, and that's yeah. And I don't know about the specifics of what the finances that you're talking about, but I do know that that the financial angle is even greater and deeper than you're describing because it's in all it's 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 transparently there in all the various institutions that we have: our universities, our our federal broadcaster, our our professions. Uh, I mean, it's. It's all there for everybody to see. Even if even if it's not all visible, it's, it's a lot of it is visible. And the 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 difficulty that we have, I think, um, transcends the finances. In a sense, we have this challenge: we are trying to advocate an abstract idea. The abstract idea being freedom of speech and individu individuality, which, if you are sold on those things is an easy thing to understand that it's a, a superior idea. But it's an abstract idea. So if you don't really get it, the concrete group belonging this is right idea is a much easier idea to sell. I mean, it, it's, it's concrete in the sense you can say, well, look, this person is having this difficulty and you must say this to them. Here's your marching orders. That's concrete. Go and do it. That's easy to sell because it seems reasonable. How could anybody have a problem with that? You must understand that that's abstractly wrong in order to understand that the whole idea is wrong. And that's a hard road to hoe. The, our, our, our historical problem is that the, the, the cultural traditions we come from, individuality, liberty, democracy, they seem well established, but they're a mere blip in the history of civilization. Most of the time it's been otherwise. And once it's lost, it's seems to be a very hard thing to get back. So the influence of foreign money on our culture is, is very real if we look at the media, right? George Soros funds things like Right Wing Watch and Media Matters. Um, they've called me a white supremacist. They've called Ben Shapiro, who is an Orthodox Jew, a white supremacist. Uh, the Qatari government through Al Jazeera is working with people like the Young Turks. This is a real problem. The way that we be proactive about these foreign funded platforms that are pushing some very politically correct dogma is that we have to build up our own platforms, right? We can't always be complaining that CBC doesn't talk about our viewpoint enough while we're not doing anything to build up our, our own networks, our own independent media or anything like that. We can't keep complaining about, you know, Twitter shadow banning your favorite political commentator and not showing the news that you like if you continue to use it without any pushback, right? So, I mean, the, the activists who are in charge of pushing this agenda, there's not a lot of them, but they are committed. And they're very happy to commit their finances to toward this cause. And I, I just hope that we can be as committed with our own finances, our own resources, to not just pushing back and debunking everything they say about us, but actually um, getting ahead of the message and be, being able to shape our own narrative. What I can do on that, defunding the CBC. So that yeah. will help. Yeah. <laughs> mm. And directed towards Max specifically. Uh, given all the issues around free speech and the fact that the Supreme Court of Canada has allowed infringements on free speech uh, under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, would you consider or would the PPC consider uh, in including in this platform uh, the repeal of Section 319 of the Criminal Code, which bans free uh, hate speech? Uh, just because hate speech itself is so broad that I feel like as a legal tool, it is very dangerous for society. If not now, then eventually. Yes, absolutely. We are looking at it right now. We are in the process to rewrite our platform with the same ideas because if you look on the website, I'm saying when I'll be the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, blah, blah, blah. So we just rewrite that, the same ideas, and uh, we, will, we are thinking about doing something on that. Okay. Well, let me just add that the term hate speech is not used properly by most people most of the time, right? Now, we do have a section of the criminal code that 
that outlaws hate speech, but the kind of hate speech that it outlaws is not the kind of hate speech that that people refer to when they say, well, you know, you said that I was a woman and I'm a man. That's hate speech. No, it's not. That's not hate speech as defined under the criminal code. That's not what we're talking about. 319 talks about a very extreme kind of speech that incites hatred, that's designed to incite hatred. And if you're, if you're doing a, an academic talk, for example, at a university, talking about this and that and your opinions on things, that is not hate speech, not in any way as contemplated under that section of the code. My name is Tahir Gora, and uh, I'm a co-author of the book, Threats of Political Islam to Canada. Me and my wife and family left Pakistan 20 years ago because of the fear of political Islam. Now we see political Islam here in Canada, and I'm Islamophobe as well, quote unquote. Uh, so my question precisely to Maxime, uh, how PPC would build momentum against this political Islam. And also let me add one more thing. We moved to Canada for Canadian culture, for Canadian values, not for the culture and the values we were living back home. So how could we restore those values? Thank you. Thank you very much. It will start by, uh, for us at the PPC, at our immigration policy, we want to uh, fewer immigrants, but the most important, we want people who share our Canadian values. That would be important. And and we built uh, immigration system based on points. And, you know, back then, if you are able to speak French and English or English, you had more points. And now that's not the case anymore. So we must go back of what we did in the past and being sure that will be the same for the future. So I think that the... The Canadian culture that we must celebrate, we must celebrate. And like I said, you know, unity, it is our strength. It is not diversity like uh, Justin Trudeau is saying. Diversity is our strength. And for me, it's the opposite. It's not true. It's what unites us. We must speak about that. We must have policy at the federal level that will promote that. Uh, all the money that we are giving to multiculturalism, uh, like I said, we it's not the role of the state to finance every different... Uh, uh, festivity for different community. Uh, that's your choice if you want to do that. So just put more money and re reinforce our identity and, and that would be important. Uh, at the same time, we must, today I think it was in the news, you know the report that the security agency did and they said uh, uh, extreme uh, sick uh, terrorism and the, the government said, you know, you cannot use these words in the report for being politically correct and for and they were pandering and now today I just learned that they did the same thing with uh, uh, the another community so we must be able to change that and that's that's uh, very dangerous for the country if we don't if we're not able to say and speak and explain what is the the, the challenges that we're having and using the real word that must be used uh, and what's happening, and they want to please every different community. So, so we need to have people like you that are out there and speak about it. And uh, I hope that uh, the more you speak, the better it is for our society. Can I also add that, that we're in danger of, of forgetting something about our own values, that, that liberty is a reciprocal thing, that it travels both directions, right? So someone comes to Canada and says, well, I, I'm a Muslim, I want to practice my own religion, that's, that's what I want to do, I have the freedom to do that. Well, of course you do, of course you do. But so does everybody else not to, if they don't want to, right? Or um, someone says, well, I want to think of myself as a woman. I have the freedom to do that. Well, of course you do. You can think of yourself in any way you want to. But the rest of us have liberty as well. And we will perceive you the way we think and call you what we like, what you like. Right? So, so just, because, just because someone has liberty to do something doesn't mean everybody else is committed to it. They have their own. That's all. Uh, 
Uh, hello, my name is Tigran. Uh, before coming to Canada, I grew up in Russia, where the vast majority of uh, media is owned by the state. In Canada, we only have the CBC, uh, but uh, uh, recently, just to give you an example, the CBC released an article that says, why is conservative politics such a natural home for white supremacists? And uh, it's not the first nor the last article like that that they did. So my question to the panel, and especially to Maxim as a legislator, would be, uh, would you be in favor of denationalizing the CBC so that the people who are being smeared by those publications don't have to pay taxes for that privilege? Thank you. Yes, that is part of our platform. We want to be sure that CBC, if they're so good, they would be able to have money from their viewers. They will be able to be like PBS and we'll have a, a kind of a private CBC. So that's part of our platform and that's very important for us. Yes, my name is uh, Gordon Tetty, and uh, I'm a proud member of the PPC. Uh, I really am not out here to ask questions, but I want to share a few of my experiences uh, having come to Canada from Africa, from Kenya specifically. I, my, I mean, my accent speaks volume about that. Um, <clears throat> when I joined the PPC, a friend asked me that, uh, come on, Gordon, what's really wrong with you? <laughs> I mean, th this is not a party for immigrants. Uh, really? Something must be wrong with you. That is one. Second, when I came to Canada 20 years ago, and thank you so much, Canadians, because I'm a Canadian now, I hold a Canadian passport. Okay. Yeah, when I came to Canada 20 years ago, um, uh, the thinking by then was that the Conservative Party was anti-immigrants, while the Liberals were for immigrants. The thinking then, I don't know how many of you share that view. But that is the feeling I got when I came 20 years ago. But, and I was, I talked about this last week, I mean last weekend when we were doing cleanup at the park. Um, the major parties, that is the PPC, I mean the Conservative, uh, the Conservative Party of Canada and uh, the, the, the Liberals, they are, when it comes to recruitment, when it comes to recruitment, they, they really, there is no difference. Like for example, and I know it because I've, I've been involved um, in, in community organizing for one of the major parties in Canada here, so I know how they recruit uh, members. Okay, for example, if in this region or this uh, electoral district, the majority, because they have the data, when they know the majority of the people living around here are, for lack of a better word, Muslims, they will nominate a Muslim candidate. That is a fact. Let's not run away from that. Now, those are experiences that I'm bringing to this, our new party. Parties are not just, uh, you know, souvenirs. We have created this party or we formed this party uh, for a purpose because we have ideas, we have ideals, things that we really want to push forward, our agenda to implement. We cannot implement those policies if we, we, we are not elected into power. We need to be in power. We need to send this guy as the Prime Minister of Canada. Okay, but yeah, if I want to answer that, as a politician, if you want to do, be able to achieve and do what you want to do and put your platform in legislation, yes, it's great if you're in power. But you know, I don't mind. 
I don't mind if we have a liberal government in six months from now or a conservative government and they're taking some of our ideas. That would be a victory. That was, a, I give you an example about the migration compact. I was the only one to speak against it. And Andrew Scheer, three, three days before the government signed that compact, decided to be against that because it was very popular. So for me, we are pushing ideas. And yes, I want to implement our ideas. But if it's another government, it would be OK. It's a victory for us. So we must look like that. And that's why I'm happy to do politics. That's why I hope I'll be prime minister. Maybe I won't. But I'll be always there to fight for these ideas. And if Andrew Scheer or Justin Trudeau or the NDP or Elizabeth May, they're taking one or two of our ideas and they're implement that, great, great. We are winning. That's the most important. Hello, Dave McCullough. Um, this is for everybody, both I want political and a legal comment on this. Uh, and this goes to depersoning, but I'm not talking about the Facebook depersoning or the other social media accounts, but what we're seeing with the financial depersoning from banks, from credit card processors, for instance, MasterCard a couple days ago saying that they're instituting a human rights committee to decide if you're good enough for MasterCard. And the threat that, uh, you know, the left is obviously now looking at shutting us down, you know, our livelihoods down if we start to speak out. So... That's for everybody. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a bit of a free market person, and, and so that means that uh, I have to be in favor of the uh, voluntariness of trade. And while I don't like the idea of banks, certainly don't like the idea of financial institutions deplatforming people because of political opinions, um, I'm loath to consider... Uh, creating regulation or, or a legal framework that would prevent that. Now, there is a potential legal solution to that, and that is we have these things called human rights codes, uh, and there are human rights codes that actually protect individuals against discrimination on the basis of political belief. None of our codes in Canada have that, um, but there are uh, jurisdictions that do that could conceivably uh, fix that problem. Although, as I indicated in the lead up to that, I'm not necessarily in, a fa in favor of expanding those codes. Yeah, that's from my libertarian and my practical side, so I'm a complex. But I also believe in freedom of association. But if you can't do everything with banking, you're sort of shut out of the market. Oh, but I, I agree with you, and I agree with Jared. I'm a free market guy, too. Yeah. So let me put this case to you our banks are not a free market, sure. they're protected. They're a, they're a cabal. Yeah. If you take away the protection from the banks, and if they have to compete with, with easy entry financial institutions of any kind, then they don't have the power to do what you're describing. I mean, they, they can if they want to, but if that happens, those people that they disenfranchise will go next door. And some institution will say, hey, wait a minute, there are customers out there that are being disenfranchised by these other big people. Let's go serve them. Right now, you can't really have a new bank because the government doesn't want you to have a new bank. They want you know, our big banks to be big and to be protected, and that's the problem. The problem is we're not in a free market. Well, that's because our big banks are actually who issue the money, not the Bank of Canada. Well, well, sure, but that just underlines the point that I'm trying to make, right? If you had an actual free market, then the provider of services ought to be able to do anything they want because there's always going to be a competitor who will take the people that they don't like, right? So no problem. But when you have protected industries, when you have, you know, corporate cronyism, yeah. then you don't have a market, not a free market anyway, and then you've got all these kinds of problems you're talking about. And we just need to open the door to foreign ownership or foreign investment in banking and telecom industry, and you'll have more competition. And with more competition, usually, if uh, there's a market there, somebody will be able to come. Now, you're right. You know, there's a lot of regulations at the federal level that is against foreign banks. And you can have a foreign bank here, but they're not on the same level. So you, we must get rid of that in that industry, but also in the telecom industry and other industry like that. And you can start naming off the, the industries that, that have protection, right? Just go down the list. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm for free markets, too. I like how we've all, like, 
provided that caveat first, but um, I, I think at the same time, we also have to be very realistic about what's going on right now. Like if I can give, give an example, um, there is one uh, content creator who speaks out against these sorts of issues, social justice, et cetera. Uh, he's, he's based in the UK. Um, you know, obviously, someone like the BBC isn't going to hire him. He's like, that's fine. He was crowdfunded by his supporters through a site called Patreon. Um, Patreon booted him off because Sargon, yeah, because of his uh, because of his beliefs. Uh, YouTube isn't going to monetize his ads because they don't like him, so he's not going to be able to run his business that way. That's okay. I'll just go to a different site, he thought, a, a competitor to Patreon that allows for crowdfunding and online payment processing. It was called Subscribestar. What happened with that? Oh, PayPal decides, I don't like the people who you're funding, so we're going to pull our service. Um, I, I absolutely agree. You know, hey, build your own platform. Okay, you don't want that. Build your own site. It it's gotten to a point now where these people have so much influence where we're starting to, okay, build your own bank, build your own payment processor, build your own Twitter. Again, I'm, I'm not saying that the answer is to, you know, necessarily any type of legislation, but at the same time, I don't think we can ignore how widespread the problem currently is. It's not always as easy as just go to another bank. You've, th this goes to the heart of the conversation about political correctness. These, these companies are caving to a politically correct attitude, a mob, uh, to make those decisions. And so you've got to make space culturally for these companies to not have to react to the outrage mob. And so uh, you've got probably a minority of people within, you know, whatever the banking institution is that's deplatforming that particular person. You've got to reach that institution cult on a cultural level and let them know that what what they're doing is not the voice of the everyday person, the reasonable sanity uh, sane majority. And I know that's a longer way to go, but it, it, it gets us away from a regulatory answer. Hello, my name is Paul Schmidt and uh, I'm uh, very delighted that you're having this uh, panel discussion uh, with us. It's uh, very enlightening and uh, very scary. So I'm more scared when I leave than I, before I came in here. My question is going to be uh, on the legal side. I'm just a lowly engineer, so I don't know anything about this legal stuff. But it has to do with our constitution and our laws in terms of uh, we have the freedom of speech, which I thought was in our constitution. Is it? The and charter, then yeah. we have the lawmakers that make laws. Now, it's my understanding, as a lowly engineer, that uh, a law cannot uh, 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 go above the Constitution. So if in the Constitution we have free speech, there should actually be not even hate speech. And I'd just like uh, to ask you if... Uh, oh, by the way, I'm from the uh, Mrs. Mrs. Hager Lakeshore riding, and we've just been registered in, uh, for you a week ago, and I don't know if I organized the Kimberleys here. I haven't even met her yet. Oh, yeah. She may not be here. So on the um, on the and then on the political correctiveness, uh, I would I already heard that in, when we discussed hate speech, that oh yes we have this hate speech which is so strong that's different from political correctiveness. But I'm not so sure because in p political correctiveness, uh, you know, I the other side can be not be politically correct when they call me an old white male and and worse and, and they get away with it so they're using political correctiveness without anybody challenging them so it's on one side we only have to shut up so my question is if it's in the constitution why can we not just throw out the hate speech law and say it's not constitutional this is a great it's a great question it's a, it's a great question and it's a very big topic. Let me just scratch the surface. So yes, you're right. Section two of the charter includes the freedom of expression. It's a fundamental freedom. But all, the, all charter rights are limited by section one, reasonable limits. And, char, and, and both section two and section one have to be interpreted by courts. So section 319 of the criminal code, the hate speech provision, uh, has been called constitutional by the Supreme Court because of Section 1. It's a reasonable limit. Yes, it infringes freedom of speech, but it limits it reasonably for various reasons. Right? So, so in some respects, 
you look to the charter and say, well, I have these freedoms and rights, you, and you do, except they're not nearly as abs they're not as absolute as they look to be because they can, in fact, be infringed if the government is willing to go to court and explain why they did it and why it's proportional and why it was justified and so on. So on that basis, you've got a whole lot of things in the law that do, in fact, infringe charter rights. And some people would look at the, the Charter on Rights and Freedoms as being a codification of your rights and freedoms. Lawyers like me understand it actually to be a codification of the restriction on your rights and freedoms that didn't exist before the Charter. Yes. So um, a lot of, I think, the questions we received were looking at, um, you know, what, what do we do about it? So moving, moving on to that, um, you know, we, we talked a lot about the laws, but I think the laws are only as good as the people willing to enforce these laws. Like, how do we make sure that these standards are being upheld? If, as we see, as you've pointed out, uh, Jared, that um, some of them, them are being interpreted under a certain lens and that. So how do we go back to restoring that? Speak up. I mean, I keep getting back to that is is kick open the Overton window, um, uh, you know, speak, your, speak the truth. Um, you've got to you've got to get make space for your ideas. You've got to do things like what Max is doing, where he's he's speaking about his ideas and he's doing it in a well thought way and he's doing it in a lot of places. Um, that's essentially what you have to do. You have to create uh, an, a different narrative uh, uh, that will ring true with people on the battlefield of ideas. I have some people who ask me, why, Maxime, are you going to the CBC and Radio Canada? They're not on your side. But it's important to be there. It's important to challenge them and using all channels that we can use. And I'm doing that. So be out there. And I know I prefer to do an interview with, uh, I don't know, another media than CBC. But it's a tough one. And I have to be there. And, I, you know, there's a lot of people who are listening to them. So it's our for me, it's my my job to to speak and uh, using all the the tools that I can use. And CBC is there, so yes, yeah, speak out and speak about you. And also, I just want to congratulate everybody here. You know, it's it's a teamwork. We're not alone, and you are not alone. You are there. You use the the YouTube and you use the university, and so we are speaking, and that's great. People told me today that uh, you know we are sold out, and uh, a lot of people will be able to watch that uh, that video later. So it's it's only the beginning, but we must be out there and must not be afraid to debate. We must not be afraid to debate. I think I think. I think people like Lauren are doing more to move the needle in the direction that you want than, for instance, and no offense, Bruce, but people, you know, academics in the university or lowly litigation lawyers. And I think those that are that are creating platforms, that are creating audiences and, and engaging them on the level that people like Lauren do and the online community, I think they're doing more to move the needle on this stuff than anybody. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And, and on, the, on the legal question, I mean, the law is very important, of course, but... You know, the law is not a set of objective rules, right? It's a, it's a cultural system of legitimacy, of authority. And really, to change the laws and the way they work, you have to change the culture, right? So you can't just resort to saying, oh, well, there's a book there that says this, and therefore you can't do this. The way that's interpreted and the way it's drafted will reflect the cultural imperatives, right? So you have to change that, and that will lead to legal change. Now, to the point of the the social media giants who seemingly arbitrarily exclude certain people on, again, arbitrary um, criteria, is, is it necessary for government to enforce fair play? Or are we... I look at it as from a contractual standpoint because I'm a lawyer. And when we sign up to the social media giants, we sign on to terms of service. And, and if the social media giants do not adhere to the terms of service, either by changing their editorial standards, beginning to curate your feed, or simply kicking you off for capricious reasons, um, I think people need to hold the social media uh, entities to their own terms of service. Um, and if you don't like the terms of service, then you've got to negotiate that up front. 
that could pose a bit of a problem. But but that's where I see this come comes down to is somebody's got you got to hold their feet to the flames and you can do it legally, but also continue to speak about these ideas, continue to challenge them, continue to tell them that they're reacting to a minority and an outrage mob uh, that does not reflect wider society. I, I think the issue with trying to reason with social media companies is that unlike maybe a payment processor or a bank like MasterCards, I, I MasterCard, I don't think it's necessarily them reacting to a social media outrage mob. I think it these companies are run by leftist ideologues. These these are commitments that Jack Dorsey, Jack Conte personally hold themselves. Susan something or other who runs YouTube. Like the, this is what they personally believe. And so that it makes it a little bit harder to reason with these people because you have to convince them not only don't kowtow to this mob, but also I'm not as bad as you think I am and I deserve a, a, a place on this platform. And it's, I mean, this isn't just about, you know, what can I say? What can I post? Can I be able to check Facebook to see whose birthday it is? But considering the fact that we live in a democracy and that most people right now are getting their news from places like Facebook or Twitter, I think we have a huge responsibility to ensure that certain viewpoints aren't censored. Because if these social media companies completely shape the narrative on things like immigration or on things like free speech, then we could very, very soon be living in a world where people are convinced they're voting for the right thing when really they've just been fed lies by these social media companies who have tailored what you're seeing on your feed to enforce a very specific worldview. Yeah, I, I accept all of that, but I'm still inclined to think that you've really got to have an alternative. I mean, I know people have tried. I know it's a very high mountain to climb. But I mean, some of these companies are not state sponsored monopolies. I mean, you're allowed to be in the same space as Twitter or Facebook or whatever. It's just that nothing else has taken hold. Well, currently right? the, in, with US antitrust laws, it's not really can you enter the market that defines a monopoly, it's market share. And sure. they absolutely have overwhelming well, They do have share. market share, but there's nothing legal to prevent somebody from taking that market share away, is my point. And we're, we just get into dangerous territory. If you say to Jack Dorsey, well, sure, that's what you think, but you're not allowed to express what you think in your company. I don't, I don't think that's good. I think you should be allowed to express what you want in your own company. And if Twitter wants to have certain people and not other people on their feed, I mean, I don't approve, but it is their private company. I, I would like to think it's possible to build another one. Well, actually, there is currently an FEC complaint against these social media companies after Sargon was booted off and tried to go to a competitor and PayPal denied that competitor. Some people actually began to wonder whether there was collusion going on with these uh, platforms right. and uh, the payment processors they were working on. Right. So actually, you know, this is a, a question that Americans mainly are dealing with, with their things like antitrust laws, collusion. Um, for us as Canadians, I think it's a little bit different because none of these companies are actually based in Canada. Yeah. So I'm not sure what we as Canadians could do about it, aside from trying to support platforms that uh, encourage open debate. So last question, I want to bring it back to um, the individual responsibility and what are things that individuals in this room and at the uh, online audience at large can be doing in their own lives to uh, promote freedom of speech? Be a problem. <laughs> Be controversial. I have nothing to add. Be, a, be objectionable. Be a problem. And don't be afraid to do it. Vote PPC. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll open it up to a final round of questions. And uh, look to... Two, three. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Oh, I got it. I don't think it's on. Now it is. Now it is. I can take a picture really quick. Oh, that's my finger in there. Ah. Okay. Hi. Uh, so I have two questions. This is. I have to hold this mic very close. Hello. Hello. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I can't hear. It. Okay. So, what happens with the weaponization of speech? So when you can't engage 
in a conversation, it essentially shuts down the conversation. I know a lot about politics. I talk a lot about politics. And I'm constantly trying to engage people following the advice given at the panel here. And often I'm met with the response of, oh, I don't want to talk about politics. Or um, you get one or two people who have a good example of something getting into any conversation. And then you overwhelm them with evidence with whatever, read this or read this. Here's five links. And they say, oh, well, you know, you're, you're alt-right. You've been, uh, what was the, radicalized. A friend said, you know, my wife's worried you're radicalizing me. I said, oh, well, <laughs> these things happen. But my question is, all of these useful idiots who are trying to, who you're trying to say, hey, here's the reality of our current world. Here's the legal reality. Here's the legislative reality. Here's the things that your government is trying to do. And they say, oh, don't worry about that. Today's happy day on Facebook and don't you want to share my picture? How do you combat that? Because I've been a problem and my friends put their fingers in their ears and they go, la, 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 it's not happening. So, right? I, I think apathy is actually a huge problem among Canadians, unfortunately, because we're, we're so fortunate to live in this country. We have so many freedoms. We have a pros prosperous uh, economy for the most part is that we've become very comfortable. Um, and that kind of breeds complacency. And un unfortunately, even though some people may not care about politics, politics very much cares about them. Right? You, you can want to ignore politics, but it's not going to ignore you. And I think the main thing we need to do to kind of snap people out of it and get them to wake up is to show the ways that this is affecting you. Like if you care about free speech and you think you're friends do show them instances where Canadians have had their freedom of speech infringed because because it, it has happened if you care about economic freedom then show them on paper how much they're likely to spend on taxes this year like this has very real world consequences and we need to be uh, more ready to show people what those consequences are I, I agree the world will find them and eventually they're going to want to seek the truth and if you've got it I think there's a meme online of Max offering the red pill they'll find it <laughs> That was controversy. <laughs> Hi, mine is more of a comment. I was wondering how come no one is picking up on having donations placed in cryptocurrency, especially Monero, where people don't want to know, don't want to be found out for supporting groups, especially if they're within the government or associated with the government, and no one's bringing putting that on the platform as an option of donations. Um, we accept cryptocurrency donations, just putting it out there, but for obviously political parties, I think they absolutely should. The, the issue with things like Bitcoin or Ethereum is that there is a lot of volatility. And I think part of that is pushed by, I mean, you, I see reports coming out from CNBC and places like that that have a vested interest in preventing cryptocurrency from taking off, saying that you're going to lose your money. Uh, it's a, a pipe dream not going to happen. Uh, I, I think they absolutely should, though. That's the future. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello to everyone. It's an honor to meet you all. And um, Bruce and Jared, I was not familiar with you until today, but I've really enjoyed listening to your viewpoints today. You've gained a new fan. Lauren, I watch your videos almost every day. I am very familiar with your content, and it's been wonderful to meet you. And uh, uh, Maxime. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the other guy. Uh, <laughs> Maxime. I'm very honored to meet you. Uh, yes, uh, I'm very honored to meet you, and uh, I am a prospective candidate for the PPC. And uh, I wanted to uh, ask you, um, I, th my number one thing is freedom of speech. Yeah. One of the very first things that, that drove me to the PPC was you wanting to uh, deregulate the industry. I used to be a radio broadcaster. Yeah. Um, I want the CRTC to be disbanded. I would like to see the CBC defunded. Uh, I support free speech yeah. more than anything else. I would, I would rather hear the most unpopular opinion than have anybody not have a chance to express their opinion. You have a great radio voice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I was in radio for 10 years. I'm not anymore. And the, and the industry has changed a lot since I left. Um, I will get to the question. Now, I, of course, everyone across the country, all the candidates across the country, we're going to have a lot of people who have no political experience at all, like me. And uh, some of them are going to put their foot in their mouth. Some of them are going to say some very unpopular things. 
And the mainstream media, I know, will be only too happy to jump on that and say, oh my God, look what that person in New Brunswick or that person in BC said, and paint the entire party that way. So will there be any situations where you would say, you know, we can't stand behind this? And as a prospective candidate, uh, if somebody says something that is very, very different from my point of view, how do I uh, frame where I stand? And how do we win? Because these other parties, uh, as you say, they have uh, one message. You know, the liberals are told all to say this. The conservatives are told all to say almost the exact same thing. Uh, but we d may not have as coherent a message. We obviously have a platform, but we're also free to have free thought. So how do we win when we are a party of individuals all across the country? But I think that will happen. Uh, the media will find somebody. Uh, they, they are trying to do that right now, and they will do that during the campaign. Uh, somebody that, you know, uh, that will say something that is not politically correct. But for us, that's part of the game. That's the risk. And, you know, I will deal with it. So I will say thank you very much. And that person is still our, our, our candidate in that writing. But if a candidate is doing something very, I don't know, crazy, but we'll have to look at it. But it will happen. I know we'll have the news. The first page will be, oh, that candidate said that. I will have to deal with it. I think we're in 2019. People, they, I believe in the intelligence of Canadians. So they will see that and they will... They won't judge all the party, and we, but we need to do something also to uh, uh, to be sure that our candidate will know the platform. So that's why we're doing a, a training conference at the end of August with all our candidates and our writing association about the platform and, and training them to how to speak to the media. But after that, you know, maybe half of our people on our writing association are new in politics, and that's great, and I'm happy with that. Uh, but that can happen. Somebody can say something not politically correct, and we'll have to deal with it. And I will be okay with that. We won't do a big, uh, f f big things with that. We'll, it will be the, the news of the day, and we'll, we'll do other things the, the day after. And as, as someone who works in media and with media, I just want to say, if, if you're in a position where you feel like the reporter is attacking you, trying to put you in a corner, don't let them bully you because they're going to try. They're going to try to give you questions that no matter what you say, because of the premise they've proposed, will make you sound bad. You're totally within your power to just reject it flat out and say, no, I disagree with the premise of the question. Let me tell you instead what I think and here's my platform. You don't need to play to their game just because you're appearing on their platform. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. I, I, I was just going to add that... that Authenticity isn't perfect, so authenticity makes mistakes, and authenticity can be rough in how it delivers its speech. So uh, uh, I don't think you need to be afraid of saying things in incorrect ways, um, but really, you know, think about what you're going to say and then belt it out. And you know, liberal used to mean liberated, right? Like no rules. So if you get into a corner, I mean, I don't know if Maxwell liked this, but you know, in a sense, they're the real liberals, right? The, 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 the liberal liberals are not liberal, they're illiberals, <laughs> right? I mean, the, the idea of having a candidate that doesn't have any rules about what they can say is a very liberal idea, a, a truly, classically, tr genuinely liberal idea. And that's, frankly, in the large center of the spectrum. So I think that a, a recharacterization of what it is you're about as a candidate and as a political movement is not out of place. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, Real close. Real close. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have some ideas that I can just share with you as far as ways to fight back. One is uh, if you see a newspaper article that supports the position that you hold, share it. And share the comments. And that way, people who say the things that you, that you hold 
they'll be able to tell that they got this many shares from that article, and they're more likely to write more articles because they want more shares. So one way to get them out there is to share it and to comment and help them share your message. That's one thing. The other thing is um, if people are talking about diversity and uh, blah, 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 um, <laughs> I'm saying to myself, when we move to Canada, we're not from here. We're immigrants. And when we moved to Canada, one of the things we loved about Canada was all the various diversity. I mean, we went to every restaurant and every ethnic festival and all of that. But now it seems as though the political world is breaking everybody into separate tiny groups and not seeing people as Canadian. We used to go, you could go to Europe and you could say to a group of people, I'm Canadian, and they would welcome you, and you were happy to say that. I would like to see more people who, are, who have come to Canada um, go to other countries and say, I'm Canadian, and not say, I'm this, or I'm that, or I'm the other thing, but be unified as Canadian, because being Canadian is a really good thing. And um, I think that's a message that people are hungry to hear. Uh, certainly, people who moved here from other places where they didn't like it. And they should want to embrace why they came here, which was because they wanted to have the things that Canada has. So further to your unity is our strength, absolutely. Yeah, well, so let's, let's just go back to the word diversity, right? That, that, that term has been co-opted. I mean, diversity is a great thing. Diversity is a thing that happens when you're free because people can be who they want, which is why they come, which is, ter which is a terrific thing. I mean, we, we want immigrants in this country. We want them to come here and be who they want to be. But, but that's not what they mean now by diversity because diversity has been co-opted by this social justice idea, and social justice is based upon the idea of groups. So if you look like... <laughs> a group, then you belong to that group and you better behave like that group. And you're not able, at least according to them, to decide that's not who you want to belong to, right? So let, let's, let's be clear about this. Diversity is terrific. Their version of diversity is not diverse at all. Their diversity is conformity. Their diversity is, is, is obedience. And that's not on. And I think it's been great here seeing how many people who support, um, you know, the PPC's platform are diverse, right? I mean, if we're a, a party of, like, people who are afraid of immigrants, we're, I don't know, we're doing pretty good. That's all I'm saying. And I think it's really important for people, you know, if you're not from here or you don't look like the typical PPC member, what the CBC would like you to look like, it is important for us to speak up and say, no, this isn't just what you're trying to paint them as. My, my father immigrated from Hong Kong to Canada, I'm half Chinese. And I, I love the idea of being able to be called a, a Canadian, not an Asian Canadian or like a, a female Canadian. And that's what makes this party so great. Hi. Hello. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering when, uh, what uh, can be legally and ethically be done to protect um, university professors from being mobbed, basically, or have pr at least have pressure put on them by administrators and that uh, to sort of avoid doing that. So, well, thank you for the question. Um, well, the, 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 the most important thing is tenure, right? I mean, some people slam tenure because it protects people that they don't approve of, and sometimes it does, that's true, but on the other hand, Tenure makes it possible for people like me to go and do things that other people, my colleagues, for example, might think are outrageous. So you got to have tenure. On the other hand, it's okay to be mobbed. You know, if, if a group of other profs come to me and say, you know what, we don't approve of that person that you invited to speak. Okay, so you don't approve. So what? I mean, thank you for expressing your opinion. Now let me carry on and do what I was going to do. I don't mind having that kind of dialogue with, with, with my colleagues. It's fine. 
I mean, if they want to insult me, that's totally okay. Totally okay. I don't want them to be able to fire me. That's what tenure is for. <laughs> but, but otherwise, conflict is supposed to be part of the landscape of the university. That's what we're there for. We're there to disagree and to disagree. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah, so um, bring it on as long as you're not going to silence me. That's the problem. Well, and I think we've, on our show, we've interviewed a number of heterodox professors, people uh, like Dr. Peterson, Drs. Bogosian and Rutledge, who are from the United States. They pe they speak out about things like um, political correctness running wild in academia. And I think even if you're not a student, but if you're someone who hears this message and understands the position that they're in and the risk they're taking, for speaking their mind, we need to be able to support them. You know, write letters to universities, follow them on all of their social media platforms. If they have a crowdfunding site, support them that way. It would mean a lot for these professors who are, you know, potentially sticking their necks out to be able to at least feel that they have some support necessary. You know, if it's for research, whatever, they can say at least someone somewhere out there appreciates what I'm doing. I, I agree with that. Shine a light on it. Shine a light on it. Anytime you've seen the, the instances that you're probably referring to, the the best thing that's happened is that people have identified what's going on. Uh, there's a couple people in this room, some some professors who were involved in, in situations like that, and the best thing that happened was that uh, the world watched, and somebody was there to either film it, identify it, uh, give a platform to those who are involved in it, and I think you can really help create room for hetero heterodox ideas and, uh, and, and avoid that stuff in the future. And, and make no mistake, that kind of exposure does influence the behavior of universities. They don't like bad publicity. So if everybody's watching, that makes a big difference. So that brings us to the end of uh, this panel. Thank you again, everyone, for coming out. And um, Voltaire is famously quoted as saying, you know, I may not agree with what you say, but I will defend your right to say it. That's a misquote, actually. It was his biographer who wrote that. But one of the things he did say was, man is free when he wants to be. So we have to want to be free. Thank you, and uh, 